Timothy chapter 4. And look at verse 16. Paul's admonition to Timothy. That's 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 16. He says to Timothy, Pay close attention to yourself and to your teaching. Persevere in these things. For as you do this, you will ensure salvation both for yourself and for those who hear you. You know, there, there are ministers. Um, those are, there are men who are called ministers of Christ who are not converted. We, we all know that that is a great possibility. We also know that, that you and I, though called into the ministry, are men that are fallible, that we can be deceived, not only about doctrine, but about our own relationship with God, and not merely with regard to salvation, but also just are we being pleasing to Him? And so we study 1 Timothy, not only for the benefit of the church, but for the sake of ourselves, that we be found faithful on that day, that we can be assured through the scriptures that we are in the faith, that we truly have believed in Christ. Also, um, I can speak this from scripture, I can speak this from history, and I can speak this from personal experience. Those of us who are given to ministry oftentimes have an outward look at caring for the souls of others. And we become so busy that we do not care for our own souls. And oftentimes we do not see when we are walking outside of God's will. Maybe not with regard to doctrine, but with regard to practice, with regard to our, our attitudes, our speech, uh, the wholeness of our life. And the whole part of our life is very important in the ministry. If you look at 1 Timothy chapter 3, you see that a man who does not manage his own household well does not qualify for the ministry. You will also see that all the characteristics or requirements of an elder, um, all of them except one, are specifically dealing with character and practice. And so... We have a great need not to be um, so introspective that we lose view of Christ, never. But we do have a need to think about studying the scriptures, not just to preach them, but to know more of Christ ourselves and to be able to apply them. Ezra is a great example, you know, in Ezra chapter 7, verse 10, that he studied the law of God he practiced the law of God, and he taught the law of God. And that should be something that is for, foremost in our mind. Now, it does little good to study 1 Timothy merely as an academic endeavor. Um, the Bible was not intended to be merely an academic endeavor. It does require academics does require learning, study, rules of grammar, and so on and so forth. But it, it is far more than that. It's not less than that, but it is more than that. It is for the transformation of our lives and the transformation of those who hear us preach the Word of God. And so I want to talk to you for a moment about, I think maybe the root, maybe the greatest root of evil in modern day ministry. And unless we settle this, um, studying First Timothy will just be studying another option for you in the ministry. And that is the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord. The ideal Levitical priest in the book of Malachi, he was, he was marked by the fear of the Lord. The greatest reverence for God, an absolute mistrust of self, and an absolute trust and fear of God. It must come home to each and every one of you 
that you will, along with me, we will stand before Christ one day. And as ministers of Christ, we will be judged. Now, here's something that I, I want you to think about. There, the Bible gives us absolutely everything that we need to know for faith and practice to prepare us for that great day. Yet at the same time, there is an element of mystery in the scriptures. There are some things that are hard for us to reconcile. And we must hold those things in attention. For example, I know that salvation is by works. It's true. It's just that salvation is not by my works. Salvation is by the works of Christ on my behalf. His perfect life on my behalf. His death under the penalties of the covenant on my behalf. I am saved by works. They're just not mine. They're the works of Christ. I contribute nothing to my salvation but sin. If you were to look at the work of redemption, Christ bearing my sin in some way tells me that really the only thing I contributed was my sin for which he had to die. And so salvation is grace and grace alone. Even our repentance and our faith are the result of grace. So everything of grace and we will stand before him on that day with joy inexpressible and full of glory because of him. But that does not negate other texts of Scripture that says, as ministers of Christ, we will be judged. I want you to look for just a moment. Let's go back to, to 1 Timothy, I mean 1 uh, Corinthians chapter 3. And in verse 11, Paul says, For no man can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. There's only one foundation of the church, and that foundation is Jesus Christ. And if you lay any other foundation, you may build something, but you will not be building a church. Now, then he goes on in verse 12. Now, if any man builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw... Each man's works will become evident for the day will show it because it is to be revealed with fire and the fire itself will test the quality of each man's works. If any, man work, if any man's work which he has built on it remains, he will receive a reward. But if any man's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved yet so as through fire." This, um, when it really makes it into your, your heart, when you really begin to comprehend what Paul is saying here, it adds a great gravity, a solemnity, a solemnness to, to our calling. And although it should not overwhelm us, it should not paralyze us, it should be there that one day my work with regard to the church and the church is the most precious entity of Christ. One day my work regarding his bride will be judged. And I can assume since I am far from perfect that I will see some aspects of my labor burned up. Now, holding that to be true, a sane man, a reasonable man who was called into the ministry would be struck down with insecurity. A reasonable man would be so full of fear that he would come close to being paralyzed if he really believed what I just read. Because he would be constantly asking himself, even though I labor 18 hours a day, how do I know, how can I know that my labor will not be burned up? Because realize this, there are evil men who work 18 hours a day. 
So the amount of work you do is not necessarily proof that you are doing the will of God. Also, apparent success in this world, even within Christendom, even within evangelicalism, apparent success is no evidence whatsoever that your ministry will remain on that day. We all know that there are mega churches, some of them, that are built upon entertainment, personality, popularity, methodologies, giving the people what they desire. And we do believe, hopefully, all of you, that those works will be burned up. But we don't have to consider those works at this moment. We need to consider our own works, our own lives. How can we sleep at night? I would submit to you there's only one way we can sleep at night. And that is, if as honest men, we have made a decision to strap ourselves down to one thing, Scripture alone, Scripture alone, that we reject all worldly methodologies, whether they come from sociology or psychology or leadership manuals, our church growth books, we reject it all and we determine that we will serve the bride of Christ only according to what is written. That we will not be clever, we will not be inventive, but we will do only what is written. I will not be judged on that great day for not being inventive enough. I will only be judged on that great day according to what is written. Did I submit to the dictates of our Lord? That's the only thing. And that's where we come down with what has been known throughout Reformed theology as the regulative principle of doing only in the church that which is prescribed in the Scriptures by way of command, illustration, context, being fearful, fearful to do anything other than what is directly commanded. And I submit to you today, men, that the great majority of so-called Christ ministers are not even aware of the things I have just said. And many who are aware are aware only with their tongue. One of the reasons why the whole sort of last 15 years of reformed movement and the young reformed and restless and all this other stuff that's happened in the last 15 years. The reason why right now it has almost disappeared is because you're not reformed simply because you adopt some academic view of Calvinism or you like to read the Puritans. You're reformed because you believe the primary doctrine of the Reformation which gave birth to all the other correct doctrines and practices and that is Scripture alone. I'm going to base my life on Scripture alone. I'm going to serve in the church and Scripture alone. Which will actually make my service to the church very, very simple and very, very focused and will require of me faith when all the other ministers are running to the latest idea, usually from the United States, the latest idea that makes churches grow, and they're seeing what seems to be apparent success, but I hold true to what is written, I am going to appear many times as a failure. But the question is, before whom do I want to be a failure? before the movers and shakers? Do you realize that, that most, probably the most neglected doctrine in the Bible is ecclesiology? Do you realize that here's what happens? Somebody in the United States comes up with some inventive idea on how to make a big church, then they do it, and then they write a book about it, and then everybody else buys the book and tries to imitate the same thing. Why? Because the goal, 
is bigness. And it's as wrong as it can be. Now, I know some churches that, you know, in comparison with the church I attend, would be considered very large. And they're good churches. But they didn't attempt to become big churches. They decided that they would study and preach and live the Word of God. And God bless the work. You see. And you young men, you have to make a big decision. And if you make the right decision, I want to guarantee you something. You're not only going to have to go against the current of all your other friends, but you're going to have to go against the currents of your own tendencies. But do you want to be God's man? Or do you want to be, I don't know, a conference speaker? One of the things that I am quite aware of, for some reason, I have been asked for the last several years to preach in many large places. But I'm no fool. I look out in that audience sometimes and I see men who are pastoring churches of 75 people who have forgotten more about God than I will ever know. Who are more holy, more worthy, more knowledgeable, and more pleasing to God. You'd be surprised who I call on the phone when I have a question about Scripture. It's usually some guy who pastors a church of about 150. Now, I'm not trying to glorify small churches or say that larger churches are bad. But what I'm telling you is neither of those things matter when it comes to being a man of God. What matters is this. Are you going to be faithful to what is written are you going to do what is right in your own eyes? And I want to tell you something. In this last year, not just politically in the United States, but religiously in the United States, we have seen the true colors of many who claim to be reformed, conservative, and evangelical. And so you're going to have to make a stand. The question is, what are you going to stand on? the latest church growth book, the latest book that tells you how to be relevant as a Christian in culture, some silly little piece of trite like that, or are you going to stand upon the Word of God? So it doesn't matter if we study 1 Timothy. If you don't fear God, if you don't fear God, and you can't fear the God you don't know, You see. And how do you know Him? Through the study of Scripture and through prayer. Now let's look at another text that I, I want you to see. Uh, before we go on to 1 Timothy, we may not even get to 1 Timothy. Look in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. In verse 6 of chapter 5 of 2 Corinthians, Therefore, being always of good courage and knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord, for we walk by faith and not by sight. Now, we hear a lot about faith today. Faith comes down to trusting in the character of God and trusting in the arm of the Lord. And the more you trust in the arm of the flesh, the less you are going to see the arm of the Lord. The more you give yourself only to those weapons of warfare that the Lord has given you, the more you will see His power. And the more you stray from that, the less you will see His power. You may see false fire. You may see all kinds of rattling and noises and everything else. And you may become very, very popular. But God is not with you. It's the man who refuses to trust in anything except what God has written. And that's the kind of man that God 
will bless. What are the real weapons of our warfare, if I were to boil it down? That will come in these sessions that we study. But what are the real weapons of our warfare? I'll tell you what they are. The proclamation of the Word of God, unadulterated, not filtered through culture, not filtered through felt needs, not filtered through what the culture wants, but the Word of God proclaimed. What's another weapon? Intercessory prayer. Intercessory prayer. What's the third? A godly life. A godly life. Those things are always assumed in those silly little books you read about church growth. The problem is they shouldn't be assumed because there are so few men today who depend only upon the three things I mentioned. Now, we walk by faith. We trust. When I walk out in a pulpit, I am Ezekiel. And that field in front of me, that pulpit, dead bones. And no one's coming out of there alive unless the Spirit of God does a supernatural work among men. And God has promised to most do that work when I submit to doing what I've been called to do, and that is proclaiming God's Word and calling dry bones to live and recognizing, can these bones live? Lord, only you know. I will not say no and doubt you. I will not say yes and presume upon you. I will only do what I have been commanded to do, and that is preach the word of God. Now he says, hey, we are of good courage, I say, and prefer rather to be absent from the body and to be home to be at home with the Lord. Therefore, we also have as our ambition, whether at home or absent, to be pleasing to Him. That was Paul's great ambition, to be pleasing to God. That was it. He did not judge his ministry by comparing it to other ministries of young men the same age. He did not do that. How did he know whether or not he was being pleasing? Only if he could judge his life by the standard of the Word of God and see that there was conformity. And that's all you need to concern yourself with. You stand only before one Master and He has given you His Word. He has not given you one bit of authority to invent something new or to recycle the old and give it a new presentation. He's not given you that right. Not at all. And when you do it, you, ad you adulterate the Word of God. You distort the Word of God. It is never men who try to conform their culture that conform to their culture that change culture. It's the men who look at culture and say you're dead wrong. Everything about you from the top of your head to the bottom of your feet is wrong. I'm not going to try to build bridges. I'm not going to try to make a truce with you. You are wrong. I'm not going to come on your side so that you'll come on mine. No, I'm not moving. I've drawn a line in the sand. And I am telling you what God's word says. Thus saith the Lord. Thus saith the Lord. Be pleasing to Him. Be pleasing to the one who died for you. And the only way you can know whether or not you're pleasing is by doing what the Word of God says. It is the only inspired writ Scripture that we have. Now he goes on. And he says, now why does Paul say he wants to be pleasing to the Lord? He's going to tell us two reasons, but look at the first one. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. I don't exactly know how to make this fit. 
I know what I know about sovereign grace. I know that my salvation is only in Christ and Christ alone, and I know I'll stand before him on that great day in spite of all of Paul Washer's failures with great joy. But that does not take away from what I have here. My ministry will be judged. Not just my ministry, my family, the way I treated my family, my children, my wife, it'll all be judged. And to be honest with you, yes, it does make me tremble. Now, verse 11, Therefore, therefore, Knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade men. This verse has been misinterpreted maybe more than any verse I've in the Bible. I mean, it, this, it's at least in the top ten. People have the idea that Paul is saying here, um, knowing that men are in danger, that their souls are in danger, in danger of eternal destruction, knowing that I'm preaching to lost men, I'm going to persuade them. I'm going to do everything in my power, knowing the fear of God and the judgment that awaits those men, I am going to preach to them the true gospel and I'm going to beg them to be reconciled to God. That's not what this text is saying. Paul's saying this. Paul's saying, knowing that I will stand before Christ and be judged for my ministry and my preaching to men. I'm going to persuade them with the truth. I'm not going to change my message to please culture, accommodate culture. I am going to preach only the Word of God that has been entrusted to me. Do you know why there are men today that two years ago I stood on a platform with and preached that I will no longer preach with? It's true. Evangelicalism has been shaken to its very core. And you know what? If I had to, if I had to nail down what is the biggest problem, it's this. Men desiring to appear academically and culturally sophisticated. Doing everything in their power to make the world think that as Christians they're not as dumb as Im or imbecilic as the world thinks they are. That they're actual great academics and culturally sophisticated and they believe in Jesus. And that has caused them great harm. Again, we are not seeking to please culture or the world. We love the world. We want the world to come to know Christ, but it's not going to come to Christ by us trying to appear as much like the world as possible. Our men who are in a constant state of wanting to dialogue with the world, but never tell the world they're wrong. So, it says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade men. But we are made manifest to God, and I hope that we are made manifest also in your consciences. Now, I want us to go down here for just a moment because we're not, not here to study the book of 1 Corinthians. I want you to look at something. Look at verse 13. For if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. If we are of sound mind, it is for you. For the love of Christ controls us. I need to be of sound mind when I preach my rationale ought to be reasonable. I ought to move with a logic. I ought to truly teach the text. I ought to be reasonable in my presentation of the text. I ought to have fine arguments with regard to the text. 
But I'm never going to avoid the fact that the enemies of the gospel are going to say I'm out of my mind. The cultural elite are going to say I'm out of my mind. The academics are going to scoff at me as one out of his mind. I cannot change my message because of that. I remember one time I was asked to give a lecture at uh, a university in Lima, Peru. And in Spanish, of course, and that's not my first language, so it was going to be difficult giving an academic uh, lecture with regard to certain things about Christianity in a language that wasn't my first. And I realized that the crowd was very, very hostile to Christianity and very hostile to the, uh, very hostile to the gospel. And so when I walked out on the platform, the first thing I said is this. Before I say anything, know this. I believe that Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. The eternal Son who became a man, who lived a perfect life and went to Calvary and on that cross bore the sins of His people and was crushed under the wrath of God. He died and on the third day He rose again and is now seated at the right hand of God and will judge every one of you in this room. Now that we got that clear, we can go on with the lecture. I'm not going to sit there and, and dance back and forth where people walk out of the building and try to figure out what I am. This is who I am. And so it, it matters little to me if a world that applauds the murder of millions of babies tells me I'm out of my mind. That matters little to me. And that's the stand you have to take as a man of God. Now, you're not to be mean. You're not to be belligerent. You're not to be brash. You're not to seek to humiliate. But you stand your ground in love and service, but you stand your ground. Now, look at verse 14. For the love of Christ controls us. So, he's already told us that one thing that is a motivation in his life is the knowledge that he will stand before Christ. He says here that I must appear. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. And that was one of the motivations in Paul's life. Now here's the greatest. Verse 14. For the love of Christ control, controls us. Now again, people get this wrong. They think Paul's saying that his own great love for Christ is what motivated him. That's not true. It was Christ's love for Paul that motivated him. And yes, there is a big difference. If I look in the mirror of God's Word at my own love for Christ, there's not a lot to be motivated about. I find my love up one day, down one day, inconsistent, mutable. My, my greatest sorrow is in not loving Christ as I should. But when I look at Christ's love for me, now that's a whole nother story. Immutable, infinite, performed, accomplished, proven time and time again. Even after the one great proof that required no other proof, which is Calvary. That's the motivation. That's why we're faithful, like Polycarp. They have to burn us. Because for all the years of our life, Christ has never betrayed us once. And so we will not betray Him. We will not betray Him at the stake and we will not betray Him at the, in the pulpit. And so this is, this is some things that, that we really need to come to grips with that are extremely important before we even look at I don't want you to look at the pastoral epistles and think it's just another option or another methodology for ministry. If I said, I'm going to, out of 1 Timothy, I'm going to draw 
uh, some options for you with regard to methodology for ministry. Every seminary in the world would let me teach there. But when I tell you, no, I'm not going to do that, I'm going to tell you the only way to minister. And if you don't minister this way, you're wrong. Well, that's completely different, isn't it? Do you really think that Christ would allow, would, would turn a group of men like us loose on His bride without giving us very specific commands with regard to what to do? Do you think He would allow us just to think up ideas with regard to what the bride ought to look like and how she ought to be fed and led and cared for? I wouldn't let you do that with my wife. Nor would you with me. And so this is, we're not here to, to find some, you know, some methodologies you may want to apply. We're here to look at the Word of God and if you don't do it this way, you're in sin. Now yes, there will be certain texts in which godly men have differed even those who hold to the regulative principle. Sometimes one of the arguments against the regulative principle is this, but if ten of you guys who believe in the regulative principle get together in one room, there will be some differences among you. You know what? That's true. You know why the differences are there? Because we're fallible men. But what, what group would you rather be in? A group of men who say it really doesn't matter what the Word of God says, we're going to invent the best way to do the church, would you want to be in that group? Or would you rather be in a group with men who, although imperfect, different understandings and everything, are fighting for one thing in the fear of the Lord, to only do what He has commanded? Which group would you rather be in? Hopefully it would be the second group. Now, um, I want us to look at, at one other text, and I promise next time we will get to 1 Timothy, but I'm laying a groundwork. And it's going to be in 1 Timothy, and we'll go through this in, in several sermons from now, but I want to hit it at the beginning because it's so important. Look in 1 Timothy chapter 3, and look in verse 13. I think this is one of the most important texts with regard to the church in the entire Bible. And yet it's oftentimes just looked over as just kind of an introduction to something else. But 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 13. Well, verse 14. I am writing these things to you. So Paul is writing these things to Timothy. I'm writing these things to you, hoping to come to you before long. But in case I am delayed, I write, so that you will know how one ought to conduct himself in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and support of the truth. Now notice here, he goes out of his way to, to describe the church. The household of God, the church of the living God. Do you see that? In each case, it belongs to God. It belongs to God. And then he says, the church of the living God. Usually when you hear living God in the Old Testament, God's in a dispute. God's in a war with idols. And he's fixing to do something. And it's not going to be pretty. When you hear living God, you kind of brace yourself. Well, that's what's going on here. It's really saying the church belongs to God. Do not touch. Do not touch. This is not your church. If you came into my house and you started telling my wife, look, you need to stop doing that. You need to do this. You started telling my wife what she needed to be doing you wouldn't be in my house very long. You wouldn't. I'd tell you to get out of my house. You're not going to come into my house and set a bunch of rules. This is not your house. It's my house. It's my wife. They're my children. 
Now, you want to talk about the fear of the Lord? You're going to go into God's house and you're going to ignore because either you haven't studied or you just don't fear God. You're going to ignore what God said about how He wanted His bride to be taken care of. And then you're going to apply some silly little ungodly rules that were invented by some kind of marketer in the United States to build a big church of lost people? No, brother. Do not. Do not. Do not. I was with somebody one time and they didn't know a whole lot about snakes. When I was a little boy, we would one of our games, would, there was this really poisonous snake that was in our area and we'd get him to chase us. I remember walking through the woods one time with this person and they said, oh, look at that pretty stick. I said, it's not a stick. And they said, well, I I'm going to grab it. I said, no, you do not. And they acted like they didn't believe me. So I walked over there and I, I kind of hit it by the back of its tail and then backed up real quick. And that thing spun around and was ready to kill somebody. There are certain things you don't touch. And one of them is the church of the living God. Well, I think we ought to do it this way. Well, we, took a, we went out with a questionnaire among the city to find out what kind of church everyone would like to have. I don't even think you're saved. And if you are saved, you do not need to be in the ministry. Really? You're going to do something like that? The church doesn't even belong to the church. The church belongs to God. Now, let's talk about our bride for a moment. When I was in Peru, there were places where my wife would go with me in the jungle because it was safe. There wasn't any war going on. There wasn't any terrorism. There weren't really bad military movements and things like that. So I'd take my wife. There were other places where I would go where my wife could not come. Because if we're going through some place on a, on a boat, the military pull us over, or in some old bus, the military pull us over and they pull me out of the van and push me around and yell at me and everything else. No big deal. No big deal. But if one of them had laid a hand on my wife, oh, it, it wouldn't have been pretty. And I probably wouldn't be here today. You do not touch someone's wife. You touch a lot of things. You can beat me up all day long. You touch my wife, no, it's just not going to happen. Now, I'm not saying that because I'm an American. Hopefully all you guys feel that way. If you don't, then probably you shouldn't come back next time. It's my wife. Now, I want you to think about something. Jesus talked about us and our relationship to our children. And he said, if we being evil could give good gifts to his children, how much more the father? in heaven. So if we as men love our brides enough to die for them, how much does Christ love his bride? If we're zealous and very protective of our brides, how much more is Christ protective of his bride? Now, I'm going to close with an illustration. And this will set the tone for when we get into 1 Timothy and we start in chapter 1, verse 1. Imagine a great and fearful king who loves his bride more than anything else, more than his entire kingdom. He loves his bride. But he has to go on a long journey. So he calls you as his steward to come forth. And it's, it's fearful to stand before him. And he tells you this, I'm going on a long journey and you have been entrusted with the care of my bride. She is most precious to me. I have given you, I have written it out, what you shall do with her and what you shall not do with her. You are not to add to this list and you are not to take away from it. If you serve me faithfully, 
you will be well rewarded. If you do not, it will not go well with you. And he goes away on a long journey. And as time goes by, the people in his kingdom become bored with the king because they become bored with his bride. You know, she's dressed in just a simple white dress. She's beautiful, but her hair is not made up in any worldly fashion. She doesn't need or use much makeup or anything else. There's a beauty to her, a simplicity to her, a purity to her. But the men of the kingdom have lost interest in her. She's old-fashioned. And so you decide you're going to help the king. You change her simple white gown for an extravagant robe. You give her a new hairdo. And you paint her, fo you paint her face like a prostitute. And you begin to march her around the kingdom having dressed her in a way that will attract carnal men back to the king. When that king comes back, what will he do with you? He will kill you. I submit to you that's what many evangelical pastors have done in the United States and Europe. People aren't interested in the church. People aren't interested in simple preaching. They're not interested in prayer meetings. They're not interested in sermons and teachings on holiness. They're not interested in calls to deny yourself, take up your cross. They're not interested in all that. So we need to find out what they're interested in in order to save the king's kingdom. I want to tell you something. On the day that Christ returned, you don't need to fear for the atheist as much as you do those kind of ministers. Now, this does not mean that we all dress in Puritan clothing. This does not mean that we all walk around with faces of nothing but solemnity. One of the greatest marks of the fullness of the Holy Spirit is joy. There's a winsomeness, a kindness, a joyfulness to true Christianity. But as ministers of Christ, we need to be extremely, extremely careful. Now do you see why I begin with 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 16? Pay close attention to yourself and to your teaching. Persevere in these things, for as you do, this will ensure your salvation, salvation both for yourself and for those who hear you. Yes, dear brothers, we have been granted a great privilege, but we have been given a tremendous burden. And, and you need to see what a success is. It's not defined by how many conferences you speak in. It's not defined by how big your church is. It's defined by your submission to the Word of God. And that brings great comfort. A man can go to bed at night knowing I am not greatly popular. I am not well known. But I have served my king this day according to what is written. That man will be highly honored. You see. Let's ask a question. Why would God plant the most beautiful rose He's ever planted in a forest?